Good morning, friends. A little bit of a lag in getting going today. It took a while for everything to wake up. But now I'm coming to you from, from uh, Boise, Idaho. We're triple digits uh, temperature-wise. And that's just the joy of summer. As one person remember, reminded me, this is where, based on where we live <laughs> and the time of year. So today I've been talking about tunings for different instruments. And one of the questions that came to me from somebody is, why do we use the DAA tuning? Why do we do this? And so there, there are so many reasons. And, uh, and this question is quite, it's quite not unusual. Well, that's a weird way to put that. I hear it a lot. Let me put it that way. So I want to address that today. Why DAA tuning? I also want to point you to where we have... Let's find this. We're going to do you. And in the blog... Okay, so let me go back. There we go. All right. So why DAA tuning? This is a 155 tuning. It became known as DAA as the kind of shorthand standard when we got to the end of the 1980s and people started talking about tunings by um, names or... Um, notes rather than calling them by this this is the little bit of the history um because the and i'm gonna change my camera so you can see my dulcimer over top here overhead and i think there we are there we are so this is my mountain dulcimer the one i built first back in 1980 and uh you can see it, it doesn't have any extra frets. It has the traditional diatonic fret layout. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's no six and a half fret. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 frets. Depending on where the strum hollow shows up, some instruments stop at 14 instead of 17. But this one was designed so that I could have um, 17 frets here. And the traditional way that things got talked about comes from before there were frets that went all the way across the fretboard. There were just, there were four strings, there were fence staples under the first two strings, which were grouped together like this one is. And these other two strings would always just play whatever note they were tuned to. And then this one would play based on where I started my scale on the fret numbers. Now, when I tuned so that my bass string was at a particular pitch, and I've talked about hooing into the hole, la, 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 Ooh, that's the one that my instrument gets really excited about. It's kind of around E that this one really wants to vibrate, but I've got it tuned to D because I've trained it to play in D. And so my bottom string would be a D, and then I would make my other strings line up so that that would be normal. Now, typically, it would be a... I'd count zero as the first step of the scale, zero, one, two, three, fourth fret, but that's actually the fifth step of the scale. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, or one, two, three, four, five. If I use Arabic numbers as the steps of the scale, I tune my middle string to match whatever the bass string is right there. And then I'd make my decision about how I want the melody strings to be tuned. Now, the reason this is tuned one, five, five, that Do, Sol, Sol, or D A A D A D A B C sharp sorry D E F sharp G A 
is where these other strings are, is because when I start at zero on A, A, B, C sharp, D, at the third fret, that's how I get from Do to Do. And when there are no extra frets on the instrument, that's the only way I can stay on one string and play the major scale. If I start on zero, I get this te do or the flat seven do. If I'm starting here, I'm playing A as my first pitch. A, B, C sharp, B, D, F sharp, G natural, A. That's actually the Mixolydian scale. And there is no way for me to play that G sharp. It doesn't show up on the instrument right now. These strings are the same on the middle and the melody, so there's no place on the middle string to go pick out that note. And the D scale on the bottom string only has a G natural in it, so there is no place, no possible way for me to play the A major scale or Ionian scale without a six and a half fret unless I really bend. Because that's the way the song, the instrument is laid out. Now, when I do play that A scale, my drone doesn't quite line up. So the reason that DAA becomes a standard when we've chosen D to be our standard, which is the other piece of what happened at the end of the 1980s, if I'm playing DAD, I've got the notes below Do, so I can play songs that start below Do. There are certain groups of songs that do that often called plagal tunes because they play between do and or between so and sol instead of between do and do. If I'd want to play Joy to the World, which is a very good authentic tune, which stays between do and do, that's what authentic means. All I do is walk down the scale from 10 to 7. So that lays perfectly there. But if I wanted to play Happy Birthday in the same place, let me see what happens. That note was weird, and it finished weird. And that's because that's a song that doesn't stay between Do and Do. It starts on Sol. So it ends on Do, but it does not start on Do. It plays between Do and Do. There are a lot of tunes that do this. Not the vast majority, but a good number of them. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That's a good example of a plagal tune, which starts below Do. Holy Manna is another one that does that. Um, Angeline, the baker, Angeline, I know, should have married Angeline 20 years ago. That's a plagal tune. That we now be done. Heal for heal and toe for toe. All around and round we go. All for men. Another one. Um, there are a lot of Scottish tunes that do this. Little lilt in the song I sing, there's laughter and love. 
So if I'm playing with a noter, my song uh, Soaring. all in the melody string because of the tuning. So that's, that is the first thing. The tuning permits me to play the melodies of songs that are authentic and plagal in two different places without retuning. And in fact, this is the only way I can do that and have my drones line up. Now, the other thing is the other characteristic of this tuning is my noodling position. A noodling position is a way to mechanically find harmonies that are going to sound nice. So if I play my melody at the third fret, which is D, starting the scale, and I put something on the bass string, one fret toward the nut, so one fret lower, the only place I have to make an adjustment is at the sixth fret. Because I, if I do this, if I put that flatted seven in there, it it sends me in a particular direction, and mostly in D, I don't want to do that. So that is the one place I'm going to have seven and seven line up. Oh, that sounds like cocktail hour, doesn't it? And then I'm going to have eight and seven line up. Otherwise, I can get. This, this beautiful harmony, this very sweet. By simply, I'm not thinking what are the notes. It's basically a sixth interval until I get to the to the fives right here at seven seven. It's a fifth apart. African uh, National Anthem from the African National Congress, anyway. Nkosi Kele Africa. Just popped into my head, and that harmony is right there. The intervals... allow me to play very tight chord shapes. So... So a song like Abide With Me where I wanted that six. So it lets me play things like hymns with very tight harmonies that are very rich and full and not dispersed. In a DAD instrument, I'm often playing harmonies that take up, they go outside of the octave to get the extra note. By definition, if I play D, F sharp, A, I'm as tight as possible. I'm not able to play that because this string 
is already a fifth above. But if I play, that is as tight as that's going to be. That's the third, the fifth, and the first. It's a, the intervals are as close as they can be. And that lets me get those very close intervals for playing things that want that kind of a sound. Now, that is technically and physically why to play in DAA. But let's also talk about the fact that along with adopting D as our standard for how we're going to tune things, there's a good reason for why that happened. Um, I'm told David Schnaufer was one of the advocates for that because the when he's playing with in sessions in uh, Nashville and playing with old time players, a lot of the songs in the old time sessions started in the key of D and then they moved to G and then they moved to A. If we're already tuned to D A A, which gives us D as our kind of home framework, when it's time to play those chords that works and we can very easily pivot to getting to G and A without doing much. But in order to do that, he was assuming some things. He was assuming there'd be a six and a half fret. He was assuming a DAD tuning and the use of a capo, which on, a, on chromatic instruments is very predictable. Every time you move the capo, what you're essentially doing is making the neck or the length of the string shorter. So you're just raising the pitch and everything else that happens. On a mountain dulcimer, you're doing the same thing, except you're not only changing the pitch, but because of the string lay or the fret layout, we're changing the mode as well. So it doesn't, it's not an automatic one for one comparison. There's a little bit of uh, mental fine tuning that goes into the use of a capo. That said, it makes the mountain dulcimer with a six and a half fret to DAD very flexible for playing with other people. And that's what he advocated, and a lot of people did it. And so much so that there are some people that only know DAD as a way of playing the instrument, and they can't fathom why there would be another way. There, there is a lot of confusion when trying to play DAD, however, when you're starting, because you're looking for those notes that go below do for those songs, and you have to leave the melody string and go to the middle string to get those notes in order to play. Or you have to pitch the whole thing up an octave, so now you're starting at the seventh fret to go up to 14, and you're getting your notes below do on the melody string. And the people that I've worked with who are beginners find that very confusing. So for the purposes of teaching, many instructors start with this tuning, the 155 tuning, the DAA tuning, because so much can happen on the melody string without having to leave it, especially if you have people who have some situations where playing with a single finger is going to be their only way of playing. They're playing either with the thumb, the side of the thumb, their finger, or a noter. Of, there are many kinds of noters. I'm teaching a Galax and more traditional noter style class right now. Um, I'm with, we just finished our second week of that class, and we're dis discovering all the music can be played this way. And people who have been in, uh, introduced or indoctrinated in DAD tuning are often confused by why we would need to do this, because so much other music can be played in 158 tuning. It's perfect. Why not? Well, the way the dulcimer is traditionally laid out, it makes it very accessible for playing a lot of music and very accessible music, especially when people don't understand music. And a lot of people who come to the dulcimer are people who've had a whole life of something else. They sometimes have had musical background, but sometimes haven't. Often have a feeling of inadequacy, sometimes even shame because of what their previous experience with music was. Either somebody told them they had it they couldn't sing and they should just mouth the words and say watermelon in the choir or because they gave up on whatever their musical instruments were when they were kids, pre, pre in school, pre high school or during high school, they played through college and then life intervened. Now they're coming back to music and they're often feeling like they're behind the eight ball or behind the times because they don't remember everything and they wonder whether they can do that. 
my father's experience was he never had music lessons. He loved music. He he understood what he remembered what who sang what and played what on what show or on Broadway or he he knew those things. Um, and he appreciated music, but he never thought he could make it himself other than play the radio. That was his line. I could play the radio. He played my dulcimer and started discovering he could make his own music. And it tickled him. He built two after playing mine. And he would play it as something for him. So it invigorated the creative side of his life. And he chose this tuning, DAA tuning. So one of the reasons I advocate it is because it's accessibility and in honor of my dad. I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to advocate that people do this. That's why there's a dulcimer pledge, which encourages people to retune so they can experience the all the riches of their mountain dulcimer in its different different ways of playing. Um, it's got a historical connection. The songs are laid out in a way that they can be very easily and accessibly played. And the chords are very rich and full and easy to find. So for me, that's why to keep playing in DAA. The argument that some people make is, well, our club plays or my group plays all in DAA, or we all play from the same book. There is um, the, the, the wisdom and the brilliance of what Stephen Seifert did with his Join the Jam books was create books for the repertoire that a lot of people in the dulcimer world learned to play. Some people knew that music before they came to the dulcimer. A whole big passel of us didn't know the songs that other people considered to be dulcimer songs. And so he, did the, he gave us this resource. It's beautiful. Join the jam. I want to jump in. He did it in two different tunings so that people tune DAA and people tune DAD could in the same jam play the same tunes at the same time because you don't have to be in the same tuning as long as you're playing in the same key, which in this case is D, you can be in different tunings. However, that helps you play. You can go to a jam session, and if somebody says this is an E minor, if you're in DAA, I'm just going to start playing my E minor chords. I could capo at the first fret, and I'm going to get something like what they're talking about. So I don't have to retune to play with people who are tuned to DAD because I'm in DAA and I understand what its possibilities are. So the benefit of that gift from Stephen and Dave, I don't know if Dave Haas did a DAA version of his book. Um, he's got one with a lot of those tunes that are in DAD. My new book for Hal Leonard is all in DAD or DAC because they wanted it to appeal to the vast majority of players. And so I didn't do arrangements for DAA because I was fitting within their categories. And sometimes that's one of the where one of these questions come from. The vast majority of people don't do this, so why should we? Well, the answers are the ones I gave you, as well as there are some places in the country where DAA is the preferred tuning. And that's not to be a judgment. I don't think we have to add more ways to shame and judge each other and say, well, you're doing this, you must not be as good as we, or I'm not as good as you because I don't do it the way you do. I don't think we need any more of that in our lives. There's plenty of that to go around. Find the tuning you like and play in it. When you get bored, change it. Try something new. And this one is just waiting for us. So let me... Uh, Uh, let me share. If we go to Dulcimer Crossing in the blog, I'm gonna I'm right here at dulcimercrossing.com. I click on blog, and then I can search up here and say D A A in the little icon says search, and it's gonna show me why use the D A A tuning. And here's a whole blog post on why to use the DAA tuning. I'm going to put this into the into the uh, comment section of the. And thank you for a lot of Dave's tunes are shown in multiple tunings. Okay, 
but not all of them. Got it. Okay. D, the keys of, yeah. And so there is a, this is where I talk about that again. Why use it? So, and several of our, of our workshops or several of our, um, several of our lessons have the same song in two different tunings. Not all of them because some work better in DAD, but a lot of them have both. And that's why. So on Dulcimer Crossing, we're honoring both that as much as we can. Now, I also want to call attention to, let's see, what else are we going to talk about to share? Oh, 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 I'm going to have, there's going to be some songs, and Aaron May is going to play in place uh, a DAA tune, and I'm going to play some DAA tunes. This weekend on Sunday, on online concert thing, Aaron May and I are going to give our Summer in the Shade concert. And you're welcome to join us there. These are, and there's a whole group of 11 of our different pop up rest stop concerts from our 2019 across the country tour. If you want to go have a little fun, I'm playing several of those on my Galax instrument, and I'm playing those in that, in the, 155 kind of framework. So that's coming up on Sunday. And we also have uh, let's go here. Let's go there. Yes. And tomorrow is our workshop with Patty Emelot. This is workshop week. I'm uh, so excited that she's going to be here. She's from Looney's Fortune in uh, Southern California. They play Irish music. And so she's going to focus on jigs. And this will be a hammer dulcimer focused workshop. And Erin May and I will be there to do the mountain dulcimer translation. And she's got several tunes for us. This is the kind of thing that is a benefit for uh, workshop and uh, mentor level students of Dulcimer Crossing, you can, by using that link, sign up just for her, just for this workshop and get access to the workshop on Thursday, or if you can't be there then, the archive video that will be available afterwards as a replay. You can also, if you're a DIY member, you can also upgrade your membership just for this month in order to take advantage of that workshop. That's, it's uh, $25 for the DIY membership a month. The workshop is $50. That's the workshop fee. So you could just add 25 to your workshop and upgrade, and then you'll get the workshop for $25. So you can downgrade after that. Um, so there you go. It's, it's a good benefit. But just join us for Patty's workshop, and uh, then the archive video will be ready after it gets processed. Uh, the one other bit of news is I will be out for a few weeks because I'm getting a new knee. Um, I've been on the, the uh, I call it the transplant list. It's actually the replacement, having a knee replacement next Wednesday. So Aaron May has graciously agreed to be our host for the Wednesday live streams. And for so starting next week for three weeks, she'll be doing that. There'll be a different um, topic each time. And uh, she'll be letting you know what those are. And I'm very grateful. It's exciting to see what she did when I was on vacation and out visiting my sister. Um, I'm excited to see what she's going to be doing this time. And I know that that's a benefit for you, too. So thank you for your attention today and for um, exploring why we use the DAA tuning. And I look forward to seeing you when I am back in the saddle. And I just encourage you to keep playing. Keep playing. Keep playing. Bye.